All right, let me tag a couple of people first. Get a couple of people tagged on here. See if we can get some brothers and sisters joined in there. See if we can get sisters joined in there. I got oh man, I got my brother Kenneth Moore, boy. That joker, he be fighting tooth and nail. Now I ain't even gonna tag nobody. I'm just gonna let whoever come in, they come in. And so that's how we're gonna roll with that. Like to say good afternoon to all of the brothers and sisters. We are going to deal with with these uh these uh different classes of people. That first thing that we was dealing with was those uh we're gonna just start I ain't answering it. Shalawan brothers and sisters. Shalawan brothers and sisters. Uh, we're about to go into a series of videos that are going to be titled The Birth. The Birth of the Christian. Alright? And so our aim is that all of our brothers and sisters that classify themselves as Christian, that they all have a full comprehension of what it is that they are standing on. We know we got many brothers that, that uh, have a particular type of mindset that is born out of modern day Christianity. What we're aiming to do is we're aiming to show the people that modern day Christianity is very corrupted and it is not what the Bible, uh, it is not the Christianity that existed uh, before Constantine. And that's where we have to get back to. Uh, our brothers and sisters have to get back to. Those brothers and sisters that were first called Christians, brothers and sisters were moving and operating uh, based on the things that uh, the Messiah we are known to the Hebrew Israelite man as the Messiah or the Mashiach. Yeah, and he's known to the Christian man as Jesus the Christ. He's known to the Islamic man as the sinless prophet. It don't make no difference which one of these things that you choose to classify them by. We're still aiming at the same thing. And we want our brothers to be able to see Satan's hand in modern day. Christianity and then give them a comparable of what pre constantinian Christianity was like so that they can have something to be able to to be able to identify whether or not we're on the right track. So it's titled the birth of the Christian because Christian the Christian would be the last one. He would be the last one that would be birthed into existence with the purpose in this world. Uh you know, with the purpose in this world. So so We'll go from there. We're gonna we're gonna start this right here. I got King Richard on the line. King Richard, say say hello or uh, greet your brothers and sisters. I want to make sure that everybody can hear you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shalom, everybody. Uh no, you're gonna have to talk louder than that. Can y'all hear King Richard? Say something, King Rashad. About as loud as I can get. Just about as loud as I can get, Elder. Oh, uh, well, that's well, you're going to have to be loud and strong, baby. Well, I'm going to cry loud and spare <laughs> not. <laughs> can y'all hear King Rashad coming through loud and clear? Yeah, I'm sure they're going to be able to hear you, King. I'm sure they're going to be able to hear you. I'm going to make sure okay, that they can. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to make sure that they can hear you, but just don't get too soft spoken on us, all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so where we're going to start at is we're going to start. We're going to start in the book of Josephus. That's where we're going to start. That's going to be our starting point because King Rashad, what I want to do is I want to bring them up to, you know what I mean, how things started slowly, systematically changing to get to the point to where we had the birth of. And so now the birth of the Christian is going to be something that comes in that is dealing specifically with a geographical location that the people would transcend into or move into. Now you had Gentiles, you had Gentiles that believe on the Most High long before there ever was anybody that was called a Christian. There was no title or there was no label that was put on these people. So. This is what we're going to do. We're going to start in the book 
of Josephus. King Rashard, do you have your Josephus handy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, well, go to, to go? go to the War of, War of the Jews, uh, chapter 8, and pick up at verse 2. Chapter 8, verse 2. Okay. You ready? Yep, we ready. All right. The War of the Jews, chapter 8, verse 2. For there are three philosophical sects among the Jews. The followers of the first are whom are the Pharisee, of the second, the Sadducee, and the third sect who pretends to a severe discipline and call as seems. These last are Jews by birth and seem to have a greater affection, affection for one another than the other sex have. Okay, we can stop right there. Because what we want to do is we want to identify the people that's in the earth. Now, it said now, it said now, in the time of the Messiah, it said there were three specific sects that were on the earth. In actuality, it was only two of them that were here before the Messiah got here. When the Messiah got here, or Jesus got here, or the sinless prophet got here, he spawned a third sect of people. Now, keep this in mind. Listen to what's being said. For there were three philosophical sects amongst the Jews. Now, we can't do nothing about the transliteration of the words that they're put there, but we know that they're dealing with three philo philosophical sects of the Israelites, or in this particular case, they were called the Jews because you're dealing with conversionary matters, okay? But the word Jew had blanketed the entire nation of Israel. So there really is a play on words. Now, so let's get to the root of what we understand. Them. He said, the followers of the first, whom are Pharisees, which would be the religious leaders who would be connected to the scribe, the one that wield the pen, that were the keepers of the law and the religious things. And he said the second one was the Sadducees. We established this before that the Sadducees was your elite, your powerhouse people, the people that, that ruled the world, uh, and they funneled their wicked schemes and their wicked plans through the religious constructs of this world. So he said you had the religious people, and then you had the political people, or the people with money, or the wealthy people, the people that stood outside of religion, yet used religion to bring the rest of the common people up under a particular bondage. It says, and then you had a third sect. One third sect that will come on, on, on the scene would be dealing with the one that the prophets prophesied that will come into the earth. Now, now we know that this is talking about Yahshua HaMashiach. Those that follow him, they pretended to a more severe discipline because they had an understanding and a comprehension of the laws of life that came by way of the Most High's wisdom through men's thought process. So they're being taught something that is outside of the physical laws that people have. They pretended to a more severe discipline. So when we start talking about three sects of people, then we understand is that these previous two sects of people would now become the ones that will be responsible for the murder of the Messiah who came to funnel a new program into the world where those physical laws now will be translated from laws of the flesh into laws of the spirit. So, I just wanted to give you a brief upcap. Now, when we read Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, you can you read that, King Rashad? Yes, sir. Hold on. Give me a second. 49, verse 6. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserve of Israel. 
I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Now, I want to make sure that everybody heard that so that they can have a full comprehension that what we're about to witness is we're about to witness a shift in the Most High's program. Whereas, according to Hebrews chapter 1, God who has sun-dry times in diverse manners in times past, he spoke to the fathers of Israel, but he used the prophets to do it. In the last days, he will speak to us by Yeshua HaMashiach, who will be appointed heir over all things. And this is a prophecy that's 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 prophesied about a shift that's supposed to take place in the days to come. So I want you to read that verse again, loud and strong, so the brothers and sisters can understand where we're going. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the deserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So what you're witnessing is you're witnessing the prophecy going forth on what the Messiah is supposed to do when he come into the earth. Because Israel would be in a fallen state. And Israel would have to not only be raised, but they would have to be preserved through the, through the period of time. And they, uh, they would have to be preserved until they could understand what the fullness of their purpose was. So, this was the whole idea, and the whole idea of the prophecy is that, now, when you look at the Sadducees and the Pharisees, these previous sects that were here on the earth before the Messiah got here, they had caused Israel to be in a fallen place because of the bondage that they were brought up under, caused them to be totally stagnated and separated from their purpose. Henceforth was a prophecy gone forth that one was going to come into the earth and it was going to be a light thing, a very simple thing for the, for the Most High to send the sinless prophet into the world to raise up the house of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. No, it would be something much greater to follow that. Because when we look at the promise that was made to our father Abraham, the promise that was made to him is that in thee would all the families of the earth be blessed. Henceforth, now we got the prophet talking the vision out there all the way down to the end time, dealing with uh, the work that was going to come from the Messiah, that he also would give the Messiah through, through the nation of Israel as a light to the Gentiles that they may bring salvation to all men who would come in by faith. And the title of this video is, again, is the birth of the Christian. Because when we start talking about being the light, and bringing salvation unto the Gentiles. We are talking about dealing with John chapter 10 verse 12. Let me get that and read that right quick. So we just we just doing some building blocks. But it's going to get real deep up in here in a minute. Let's go to John 10th chapter. And we're going to precept this light to the, to the light of salvation. Unto the Gentiles. John 10th chapter. At, we're going to start the 15th verse. As the Father knoweth me. Even so I, the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall be, they shall hear my voice, and there shall and they shall be one one fold and one shepherd. So when we start talking about it, it's a light thing that the Most High will use you to raise up the house of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel. No, I will give thee for a light 
that you may be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. We're now dealing with the light of salvation to the Gentiles that will come by way of the things that is being taught to those that are following the Messiah. So, so that's, come on, man. I don't know how to get that out. Just bear with me one second. Oh, shoot. I must have lost King Rashard. King Rashard, I got you back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. Uh, they dropped the call on. Oh, uh, that's okay. It happens. It happens. <laughs> but that's good. It happens. But anyway, we were just bringing the people up to speed because we're looking at the birth of the Christian, which was prophetic. Now, and so our brothers that, are, that classify themselves as Christians, what we're gonna to try to do is we're gonna give them, trying to give them some understanding of the condition of the Christian that came in by way of faith in the Messiah. Hold, hold up, wait a minute! I don't want somebody to miss that. We want to give them an understanding of the Christian that came in by way of faith in the Messiah. Did you catch that, King Richard? Oh, no, I hear you. We want to give them an understanding of the Christian that came in by way of faith in the Messiah. Did you catch that, King Richard? Yes, sir. Because our modern day Christians are coming in by way of faith in who? The Messiah. Oh, no. That, that, that don't, that don't, that's not what's being exemplified in this world that we're living in. They are coming in way, in by, in by way of faith. Of a man. Now we're gonna get to we're gonna get to the root of this. We're gonna get to the root of this. Cause there is a big difference. What we talking about, there was no men on the scene talking about, you know, that have superseded the authority of the Messiah like it is in this day. Do yeah, you really do right. the, the brothers and sisters that say that they're Christians now in this day and time, do they exemplify faith in the Messiah or faith in somebody yeah. else? In my understanding, it's faith in Paul, brother. Okay, well, see that. Let let, let let me know that you're with me. I ain't got to hit you. I ain't got to hit you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so what we want to be able to draw some lines of distinction, because many times our brothers are going to be immediately turned off. They don't even have to hear what's being said, but it don't matter because the most high is like these videos. It ain't about whether people turned on or about whether they turned off. It's about putting it on record. And then anybody that gravitate toward it and blessed by it, so be it. But this is the ideal and it's a prophecy. So to our Hebrew Israelite brothers that, uh, you know, continuously have a problem with Christians. Okay, you lack an understanding in some, some, somewhere. You are lack an understanding in the fact that pre-Constantinian uh, Christianity was not the same. You see? Now, our Christian brothers going to understand some things too, so... So, King Rashard, uh, where you want to pick up at? I done went through those preliminary things, just building blocks. So, let's pick up. Let's pick up. Let's. I tell you what, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Let's go to the 10th chapter of the book of Acts so that we can establish the groundwork first that Gentiles that came in by way of faith classified as Christians. How about we do that first? Let's go there. Cornelius. Yeah, let's go to Acts 10 chapter. I don't want you to read the whole thing. I want you to read the vision of Peter. And I want you I want you to read the vision. But I'm gonna get there with you and I'll tell you what to read. Okay, so let's go. And mind you that these messages are gonna be messages of edification, building our brothers up. Not tearing them down. Not tearing them down. Acts 10th chapter, take off and start reading. At Acts 10. I think you want to start at 9. You want to start at 9 or you want to start no, at the I beginning? I want you to start at 10 because Paul in 9 is Paul's uh, conversion. No, no, I said, I'm, I'm talking about 10 and 9. Oh, no, you no, I want, want you to start, start at verse nine. 1. Start at verse 1, okay. chapter 10. Okay. All right. Acts 10th chapter. Now, keep this in mind, verse brothers one. and sisters. Brothers and sisters, keep this in mind. Paul had a declaration already that he was the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Now, in Acts 9th chapter, 
was his conversion. Acts 10 chapter is where God opened up the door for the Gentiles. So what we're going to see is that Paul was never ordained to go into the Gentiles until his brothers rejected him and the church, which was at Jerusalem, gave him the authority to deal with a people who might receive what it was that he was offering that was according to the prophecies dealing with the Gentiles and the, and, and, and the Israelites being the light of salvation. But we're going to see that, that the Gentiles that begin to come in by way of faith, and there were many of them, and we're going to see that. They were not called Christians. Christians didn't come about until a particular time. So what we put emphasis on is we're putting emphasis on the birth of the Christian. All right, let's read Acts 10 chapter. Yes, sir. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band. Of the what? Of the, of the band. It should, it should be another word there. Of the something band. It said, mine said, I got to 1611. It said, centurion of the band. Okay, well, let me. Italian well, let band. me. Let, that's right, called the Italian band. So when you start dealing with anything Italian, you start dealing with other pale faces because the Italians are spawned from one of the sons of Japheth. So, uh, so Cornelius is no doubt a Gentile. Now, go ahead. A devoted man and one that feared the Most High with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to the Most High always. He saw in the vision some death evidently about the ninth hour of the day and the angel of the Most High coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked up on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms come up for a memorial before the Most High. And now send me to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose third name is Peter. He lies with one Simon, a tanner, whose title he shall tell thee what thou says to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and devoted soldiers of them that waited on him continued. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had become, as it had been knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Where within were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No, not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What good hath cleansed? What God hath cleansed that, that called not thy common? This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision had seen should mean, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiries for Simon's house and stood before the gates and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodging there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, <coughs> and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he 
whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius, the, the sixth centurion, a just man and one that feareth the Most High, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned. I mean, was warned from the Most High by a holy angel to send for, for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and a certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after, they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that would come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or coming to one another, one of another nation. But the most I have showed me that I should not call any man come or unclean. Stop right there. Stop right there. And then back up and go to... Go read 13 and 14. And there because came a because the again. reason why we're doing this is because when we start talking about the Christianity that we know today it is a demented, twisted version of the Bible that's being taught by men that don't comprehend what's really happening. So when you start talking about Peter and this sheep, they think that you're talking about food. But in actuality, what you're talking about is the unclean Gentile who is now being ready for cleansing and ready for acceptance of the Most High by the promise and the prophecy that was given by Isaiah concerning Yeshua HaMashiach or Jesus the Christ. So let's read that, and then we're going to go back down to uh, where Peter is talking now. So you want me to start at... Uh, I want you to start 10, at thir uh, 13. 13 and 14. Yep. Okay. Verse 13. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again, the second time, what God has cleansed, that call not thou come. He actually told him, what God cleans, call not common or unclean. Peter was perplexed because he didn't understand the vision. And even though he continued to ponder the vision, his, his pondering of the vision was interrupted by the confirmation of the vision by the men that showed up at his door. Now go back to 28 and continue to read. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But the Most High has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So basically you are now getting an understanding of what the vision the sheet let down meant that God had gave him Peter because he, he declared that. He said, now, I understood what the vision meant now. He said, because at one time it was, it was uh, forbidden for an Israelite to keep company with somebody that was from another nation. But the Most High has shown me that he wasn't talking about food. He was talking about not calling any man common or unclean that he had cleansed. Now keep going. Therefore came I unto you without game saying as soon as I was sent forth. I asked therefore for what intent he had sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in a bright cloak, in, in bright cloak. And said, there is heard, and thy arms are, are had 
in remembrance in the sight of the Most High. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of one Simon, a tanner, by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before the Most High to hear all things that are commanded thee of the Most High. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive the Most High is no respect of a person, but in every nation he I mean, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which the Most High sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Amashiach, he is Lord of all. That, that word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How the Most High anointed Amashiach, the Nazarene, with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Stop, and the stop right there. Stop him. right there. Because here's what I want you to do, King Richard. Because this is dealing with the birth of the Christian. And so I want us to be able to use the, the text and the Bible in the way that the Christian man have come to understand it. We know that the difference of the transliteration of the names and things like that, we know what they are. Right. But let us not confuse our brothers with things that they don't know. Let us read the text as it is written in the book. Yes, you see what I'm saying? Yes, so, and we and yes, we already gave our Israelite brothers a warning. If our one okay. person come on this thread talking about Jesus ain't the name or trying to educate us on something that we already know because you don't understand that we're strategically aiming to raise a particular group of brothers up. If our one person come on this thread with that type of disrespect, I promise to God, boy, it's going to be some embarrassment that go forth because a bought lesson is going to be greater than a taught lesson. And if we can't teach you the lesson of respect with words, then surely you'll pay for the, pay for the lesson through, uh, through uh, means of humility. So let's just keep it in context. Now, for everybody else that's Hebrew Israelite that's learning the, the Hebrew words and all that, we understand all that. But this ain't no message for you. This is a message for the brothers that still don't know the stuff. So, let's keep it real. All right? All right. And God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of, of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on the tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openings. Not to all the people, but unto the witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word, and they of circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with thee, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Read that Spirit. again. That's because on what? Because, hold on, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid waters 
that these should not be baptized, which have both as well as we. And he commanded them in the name of the Lord, and they, they, him, to tarry certain days. So what you looking at, precept must be upon precept. You are looking at the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 49 verse 6 where the prophet declared it is a light thing that I will use you to raise up the house of Jacob and to restore the preserve of Israel. There are many brothers that deny the Messiah's existence. But who could they possibly be talking about that not only would they raise up and restore the house of Israel and the house of Jacob, he also would give them, give thee for a light that unto the Gentiles that, that, that he may be the salvation to the ends of the earth. What we're looking at is the Most High's protocol and to our brothers and sisters in Christianity, that do not understand in this modern day Christianity, you are up under a form of replacement theology where you have been taught in church that the Christian man is the man that God gave his plan to. The Christian man has become the superseder of all of the promises and all of the purposes and plans of the Most High that he gave to Israel. But keep this in mind. Nobody wants to declare that the national identity matter, none of that matter, none of that matter. Well, when you look at the prophecy that was given to Mashiach, those things that would come by the Messiah or Jesus the Christ would be given to the house of Jacob and the preserve of Israel. And it would be them. That's why the angel couldn't give Cornelius what he needed. It would be to break God's protocol. So the angel instructed Cornelius, who was a Gentile, if you're going to have salvation, then you're going to have to sin for the one who is to be the light for your salvation. Sin for one Simon Peter. And when Peter the Israelite came to teach the Gentile who knew not Jesus, what Jesus had taught him, now the door was open to the first group of Gentiles that would come in by way of faith. But you don't see anywhere in there where they were classified as Christians. So the Christian has not even been born into the earth yet. Yet the Most High's plan by prophecy is starting to funnel itself throughout the whole world. So this video, once again, is titled The Birth of the Christian. Now in our twisted, demented understanding of the scripture, we think that the Christian represents all Gentiles, but the Christian does not represent all Gentiles. The Christian represents a particular people that resided in a particular geographical location, that when they came in, they came in like Cornelius, pure at heart, pure in spirit, but from there, there were things that began to be corrupt. So we ain't even got to the birth of the Christian yet. But the the Gentiles are already coming in by way of faith. So, King Rashad, let's keep on moving. Uh this bust down. This bust down uh this this right there just totally destroyed <laughs> a lot of nonsense of the average mindset. You see, because everybody think that the Christian represents the Gentile. Now, I don't know Christian represent no Gentile. The Christian represent a particular people that was in a particular geographical location. And we're going to show you that as we keep reading. So, what I want you to do, King Richard, now, is I want you to pick up reading. <coughs> Excuse me. At Acts, 19, uh, Acts 11, 19. Yes, sir. Acts 11 and 19. Now they which are scattered abroad upon the precautions that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Serene, which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. They spoke to who? And they, they were speaking to the Grecians. 
preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. The, hold up. And now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, I want you to slow down now. I want you to slow down now. The sick, twisted dementia that comes through modern-day Christianity connects the church with Christianity. But Christian, the Christian has not even been born yet. So read that again. It says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. The church, and so they, the church was where? In Jerusalem. So the church was in Jerusalem. So when you look in this world that you are living in, and you look at everything that is classified as church, it is directly connected to the religious construct of Christianity. So you have to use your thought and say, how could this be? When the church was in existence and the church was in the hands of the Israelites, before the Christian was ever even born. You see, one of the reasons why the Christian cannot have a full comprehension of what the early Christians were meant to do is because he can't receive the fact that he wouldn't exist if it was not for the Israelite. Because the church belonged to Israel and the church geographically was located in Jerusalem. And when the glad tidings of these wonderful things that the Israelites were doing based on what they learned from Jesus Christ, it came unto the ears of the church, which was at Jerusalem. All right, go on, keep going. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all. The purpose of heart, they were pleased unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. and of faith. Mm -hmm. And much people was added unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Mm -hmm. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. They assembled they themselves with what? The church. With the church. And the church was those Israelites that were moving in the earth that had been scattered upon the persecution of Stephen. And they were moving according to the word that had came to the geographically located church, which was in Jerusalem, to help them to continue to do the work. Now, when they got into Antioch, it said, and the church assembled itself for a whole year. It is not talking about no Christians because there still is no Christian born yet. Go ahead. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, you know why the disciples were called Christians at Antioch? Now we're looking at the birth of the Christian. Because now you have Hebrew, Hebrew speaking people. And some of the, uh, the people spoke uh, multiple dialects. They spoke multiple languages. So now they can able to move into Greek-speaking territory where the people that were in the Greek-speaking territory did not speak the Hebrew language. So when it says the disciples, a disciples is one that would be exposed to the teachings of the Israelite who represent the church that had resided and planted its feet in Antioch for an entire year, teaching a people of another nation the same way that Peter taught Cornelius. He said, and at this particular time, those Greek-speaking people that resided in the Greek metropolis of Antioch, he said, at that point, they had no Hebrew language to call themselves, so those that became disciples up under the Israelites called themselves by a name 
that were conducive to their language that they understood. He said at this particular time, the Christian was born into existence. And who was the Christian? The Christian was the Greek speaking people that resided in the Greek metropolis of Antioch. And they called themselves Christian because Christian was a Greek word that could come as close as they could get to what this Hebrew Israelite thing that the, uh, was representing. Okay, now this is the first Christian being born. So when it says, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, it didn't mean that Israel's name had been changed. It meant that those that were sitting up under the teaching of Israel in this Greek-speaking city identified themselves with the anointed ones by the language and the tongue that they could understand. Because to be anointed is the same as to use the word Christ because they both mean the same thing. So when you start talking about Christ or Christos, you are talking about being the anointed ones. In the Hebrew language, you're anointed. You're talking about being the ones who have a mandate and a, uh, and a purpose to go and do a particular thing. So the disciples, the teachings of the Israelites, were born in Antioch, they called themselves Christian because it was the closest they could come to what the Hebrew word anointed meant. It didn't mean that our name had been changed or our name had been superseded, but that's what this twisted, demented, modern-day Christianity has taught people and so you have dealt with the fact that where you have superseded everybody, you have superseded the Gentile, you have superseded Israel, and you you you'll come out and you'll use a Bible that never belonged to the Christian, as though they were right there. You'll connect the church to Christianity when the Bible declares who the church belonged to. Everything that came out of the church and the, and the Israelites, everything that came out of them was a gift to you. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to find yourself going in error. So what we want to do, we want to encourage our brothers and we want to show them that you calling yourself a Christian is not a bad thing. Now, now I got to say this. Now to the Negro, it is a very bad thing. Because ain't, you, ain't no ain't no Negro got no pale face, and ain't no Negro that ran around there speaking Greek. Now, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. There were some of our Israelite brothers that could speak Greek because Paul was asked if he could speak Greek when he wanted to talk to the, uh, you know, the Roman people. He said, aren't you an Egyptian? Can you speak Greek, Paul? Yeah, I can speak Greek. So we're not saying it in that sense. We're saying it in that sense that, that you can't identify with a nationality that does not belong to you. So by that standard, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so King Rashad, now we see the birth of the Christian. Now, by the Spirit, however the Spirit leads you, I want you to pull out something and read something that can open this thing up a little bit broader to pre constantinial Christianity. Yes, sir. I got something for you. I got something. Okay. I'm ready. All right. This is the introduction to the Gospel of Barnabas. Okay. Starting at uh, page 11. It says, during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Christians left the city and refused to take part in the Bar Kochaba rebellion in 132 AD. These two events brought to the surface the difference between the Christians and the Jews. The questions of the origin of, of Jesus, his nature, and relation to God, which later became so important was not raised among these early disciples that Jesus was a man supernaturally endowed by God was accepted without question. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the words or Jesus or the events in his life led them to modify this view. Mm -hmm. According to Aristides, on the earliest apologists, the worship of the early Christians was more purely monotheistic. 
even death of the Jews. Oh, y'all see that? So the worship of the early Christian was more monotheistic. It was more monotheistic than the Jews, which were, when we start talking about Jews, we're talking about Judaism or, or some conversion or something like that. But you're talking about the early believers. It was more of a monotheism. That means that they, they understood that, behold, our Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and beside him there is no other. And they had a view of the Messiah as a man that was endowed with the power and all of the uh, attributes of the Most High, rather than to call him God himself. Now, this is what's much different from the church now, is that the church now will call Jesus God, understanding that a thousand scriptures support that that is a false statement. For if he is the only begotten of the Father, he is the Son of the Father, he is seated on the right hand of the Father. You understand what I'm saying? All of these scriptures support the fact that that, that the Messiah, or Jesus Christ, he came in the likeness and in the form of sinful man, but he was endowed with the Spirit and the attributes that came from the Father. So even, even uh, you have some other things that, like, well, we'll get into that as we go. We get go on, go on, King Rashad. <laughs> with the conver with the conversion of Paul, a new period opened in Christian Hold theology. Right, read that again. With the conversion of Paul, a new period opened in Christian theology. Now, here is the thing that people don't want to identify with. People don't want to identify with the fact that. With Paul's conversion, things began to change. You have to keep this in mind. There is a modern day saying that we live by on a daily basis. If you can't beat them, mm. finish the rest. Join. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> oh, man. So, now, listen, oh, listen. Man. We ain't speaking by way of no. By way of no thought that's against nobody, we're speaking by way <coughs> of what the scholars and the writers have put in practice. We see that in this twisted, demented version of Scripture, people classify Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. Never mind that you see that even while Paul was being converted, when he got converted in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, it took him another 12 years before he ever thought about beginning any type of ministerial work. You see, but we see in the scripture that Peter was the hand chosen apostle to the Gentiles. So King Rashad, when you read this again, we'll read these things so that we can understand as we build up because we want our Christian brothers to be edified through knowledge of the scripture and not through the opinions of men like we have been forced to do as we came up in the construct of Christianity whereby we just believe what men said. Are we to trust? We ought to trust God rather than man. So we're going to show you things in the scripture that will be in direct opposition to the things that me and the teacher and whether or not you are the child of the father or serving Jesus Christ is going to be predicated on which direction you're going to lean to. Now, we can establish those things. So read that part again and, and then keep on reading, King Sharp. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, with the conversion of Paul, a new period opened in Christian theology. Paul's theology was based on his personal experience interpreted in the light of contemporary Greek thought. It, it was based on what? Personal experience interpreted in the light of contemporary Greek thought. And it was based on contemporary Greek thought. So when you start looking at the things that came that, that are dealing with this Christianity, it is not the light of salvation that came by the disciples' hands that was given to them to G by Jesus Christ. It was a new theology that sprung forth that was according to Greek thought, not according to what the early 
Christians have received. Come on. Man. The theory of redemption was the child of his brain, a belief entirely unknown to the disciples of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Paul's theory involved the, the deification of Jesus. Y'all see that? See, the redemption was his baby. And Paul's theory put the Messiah in a place that the disciples, the original disciples that what? because you got to understand that the Bible says that Jesus looked so much like the men of his day that Judas had to go and point him out to the Roman soldiers. The disciples did not look at Jesus as a deity. They looked at him as a man who had been given supernatural power by the Most High to exemplify the Father's righteousness in the world. But it says that Paul came along and did. So read that part again. We want to make sure the brothers is comprehending what, what's being said and where we're going. Yes, sir. I'm going to read it from the beginning. It says, with the conversion of Paul, a new period opened in Christian theology. Paul's theology was based on his personal experience interpreted in the light of contemporary Greek thought. The theory of redemption was the child of his brain, a belief entirely unknown to the disciples of Jesus. Paul's theory involved the deification of Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, Paul made, Paul made the Messiah. His things are predicated on the Messiah being a deity. Now, it says that his thought process was of Greek thought. And the disciples, there was nothing, there was nothing, it, it was nothing like what the disciples was teaching. You got anything else on that, King Rashad? Uh, I think... Uh... Yeah, I got, you know, I got plenty. But okay, I'm well, let's ride, it. let's ride. You just pull it out, right. and then I'm going to break it down. I'm going to chop it down by way of the Spirit. I'm just going to keep going, keep going down the line. Okay, okay. all right. The Pauline, all right. The Pauline period in the history of the Christian church saw a change of scene and principles in place of the disciples who had sat at the feet of Jesus. Hold it. Now, see, that's that's what we're talking about right there. It said, now, listen, read that again one more time. The Pauline period in the history of the Christian church saw a change of scene and principles. In place of the disciples who sat at the feet of Jesus, a new figure who had not known Jesus had come to the forefront. Now, see, we have said mm. these things many times. We have said these things many times that Paul never knew. He never walked with the Messiah. He never talked with the Messiah. He never received any instruction from the Messiah. Yet he can now show up on the scene and suddenly be the spokesman for the Messiah and then supersede those things that were coming by way of the disciples who sat at his feet, who witnessed his miracles. This, this is what we under. This is what we have been under for the bulk of our lives. We have neglected the things of the Messiah and, and we have clung to the things of man. And we, in our mind, we have been taught that this was the sum total of our service to God out of ignorance because we never learned how to read the Bible while we was in church. Many of the brothers and sisters that are in church right now have not learned how to read the Bible. Many of the pastors and the preachers that are at the hand of the pulpit have not learned how to read and interpret the Bible as it relates to the wonderful light of salvation that Jesus the Christ was bringing into the Gentilic world. We had not learned those things. But with the arrival of Paul, Things begin to change according to his understanding and his thought process, which was based and centered around Greek philosophy and thought. This is what we got right now. 
This is what we got right now. And how are we going to break this thing off of our brothers and sisters? It remains to be seen. Because when you're going into theology school, you see the disciples didn't have no theology. They didn't have no theology. They had the words of Messiah and they had faith. They didn't have no theology. Paul was an educated man. Paul was a knowledgeable man. Paul spoke multiple languages. But there was one that he leaned more toward. So this became his baby. As you start dealing with the people. Now you see Israel come in and start teaching people and start having an impact on people and still, but you still understand that these people that are being brought up, these early Christians are still in their infant stages. And when you are a child, you can be easily influenced. And that's why it says when he came on the scene, then there was a shift that started taking place because there were being things that were interjected in the name of the Messiah that the Messiah wasn't teaching to him his disciples. So when you see things like the Messiah said, many shall come in my name. But that's to be measured. They may come in my name, but the only way you're going to believe them is if what they exemplify is based on the things that I have told my disciples, my chosen ones, my ones that I put the spirit on and told them that they were going to be the ones that witnesses of me. Is that not what the Messiah told him? He said, go up in there and you wait. When the spirit comes, you should receive the power to become witnesses of me. Is that not what he told them? He told the disciples that they would receive the power to become a witness. How could you receive power to become a witness if you never was in the house that the spirit would fall on? And this is what we got. And this is why it was a shift taking place. And this is why thus in 2020, the Christianity that our brothers and sisters are under now is not the original thing that Christianity was before the shift took place. So let's keep going. All right. It says, in place of Palestine, the Roman Empire became the scene of Christian activity. Instead of being a mere sect of Judaism, Christianity not only became independent of Judaism, but also became independent of Jesus himself. Holy what? Wait a minute. Where did you get that from? Come back again. <laughs> 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 oh no, oh no. It said, instead of being a mere sect of Judaism, Christianity not only became independent of Judaism, but also became independent of Jesus himself. Now, for those people that can't understand, let me show you what we mean, what that scripture is talking about when it's talking about becoming independent of, of, of Jesus. Okay? Let's show you what we're talking about. Let me see how many people can see this. Let's see how many people can see this. Okay. This is the book of Matthew. This is the book of Matthew. Can y'all see this? Let's see. Can everybody see this? Matthew, you see that everything in here that Jesus said is represented by red ink. All the way down till we get to the point of... John, all right? We get to John, we start seeing the last. Now, when you start talking about being independent of Jesus himself, you're talking about looking at the totality of the New Testament. How much red can you find? How much red can you find in any? You find no red. In the epistles. And this is what it means to become in, in, independent of the Messiah. It is where his words and his everything is taken out. And now they are superseded by somebody else that claims that Jesus sent them. Well, see, the words of Jesus speak for themselves. Everything that Jesus spoke, even when the disciples is speaking it out of their mouth, comes out in red writing because it is something that he said, not, that, not what they said. So there's no wonder why you can't find no red letters in Romans, in Corinthians, in 
Timothy, in Titus. No wonder why you can't find no red letters because you can't find the words of Jesus on the pages of the book. You see, when you start dealing with what Roman Catholicism established, which was according to Greek thought and Greek philosophy, then you'll understand this is that what the disciples came teaching, they had broke off and did their own thing. It's established something completely different. So keep on reading, King Rashad. And keep this in mind. These things are not something that we just come about with opinion. These are things that are dealing with the scholars and the writers of that day that had these things on record. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Paul was a Jew and an inhabitant of Tarsus. He had made I mean, he had spent a long time in Rome and was a Roman citizen. He realized the stronghold which the Roman religion had on the mass. The intellectuals were under the influence of Plato and Aristotle. Paul seemed to have felt that it would not be possible to convert the masses in the Roman Empire without making mutual adjustments. But his practical wisdom was not acceptable to those who had seen and heard Jesus. However, in spite of their differences, they decided to work together for the common cause. Now, you see that? Did you, I don't know if y'all caught that. Read that last part again. <laughs> <laughs> Read that last says, part again. <laughs> it says, but his practical wisdom was not acceptable to those who had seen and heard Jesus. See, when you start However, talking about the true Israelites who seen and heard Jesus, that was like, man, I don't care how good you make that stuff sound, man. You can get out of here with that mess. We ain't going for that. We ain't taking no wooden nickels over here. And that's what we're telling these would-be these would be preachers and pastors and apostles and pulpit pimps. That's what we tell them. You can make it sound as good as you want it to. But there ain't no ain't nobody taking no wooden nickels over here. We're trying to raise our brothers up and help our brothers to understand that unless you are abiding in the doctrine of of Jesus Christ, you're going to be in trouble. And you got to be able to know the difference, brother. So if you in church and you ain't learn how to read the Bible for yourself, if you in church and you ain't learn how to study the Bible for yourself, if you in church and the only thing that you can do when you go to church is expect to hear the preacher tell you something that's going to make you feel a little bit better about the sinful habits in your life, if you in that condition, hey man, that's not a good place to be in. God wants all of his people to come to know him and be able to fellowship with him in spirit and in truth and everybody has a personal accountability is the whole purpose of the Messiah of salvation to the Israelites because each one of those apostles they had a personal relationship and encounter with him they knew him they talked with him they walked with him they understood him and there was a sense of brotherhood when they were together and that is what the most high mean for us to have right now but you won't get it if you just sit back listening to what somebody else got to say so we have to pull the the cover off of the falsehoods we got to pull the cover off the false of the falsehoods of this new thing that is wicked and then bring it back to the Christianity before it turned so that we can be able to exemplify that righteousness. Okay, come on. Yes, sir. It said, however, in spite of their differences, they decided to work together for the common cause. Mm -hmm. As recorded in Acts, Barnabas represents those who have become personal disciples of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Paul, they cooperated with and cooperated with them for some time. Mm -hmm. But finally, they fell out. Paul wanted to give up the commandments given through Moses about things to eat. He wanted to give up the commandments given to Abraham regarding circumcision. Mm -hmm. Barnabas and the other, Barnabas and the personal Disciples disagree. And see now, see you know, see you looking at you looking at where these things happening right now. This fight is still happening because those that are leaning toward the Paulinian epistles, they still having the same fight. They want to give up the commandments that were given to Moses. They want to give up 
the things dealing with the commandments, dealing with the things that you were going to eat. They want to give up those things. The Israelites knew and understood. They wanted to give up those things. You know, so even when we look at when 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 uh they sent them away, and we will. Matter of fact, put a pen right where you at, uh, King Richard, and let's go and read that part in Acts. Um, uh, in Acts, where it's sending them away. Yeah, where he's sending them away and telling them the things that are important. Now let's look at what the disciples are deeming. Listen, this is the instruction that Paul is receiving from the Israelites and the church, which is at Jerusalem. They are giving him instructions to focus on these things right here that are important. Now, let's see how well he did with the instructions that they had given him. And let's see if he was able to keep his mind focused on the things that the church that was birthed into existence by Jesus the Christ. Let's see if those things were important to him. You got it? You said it. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm think I'm going to start at uh, 17, I guess. 15 to 17. Okay. Okay. 15, 17. All right. Let's go. Mm -hmm. It says that the, uh, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from from the beginning of the world. Holy wait, Therefore, stop right there. Stop right there. Do you see that right there? Known yes, sir. are all of God's <laughs> works from the beginning of the world. This is what I try to tell my my Hebrew Israelite brothers is always trying to justify killing the Father's creation. All of his works are known from the beginning of the world. Everything that he made in the framework of six days is the beginning. And whatever he spoke within the framework of those six days will stand forever. Everything that comes after that is sin and things that are born out of a sinful thought process and out of our fallen Adamic nature. All right, go ahead, King Rashad. Wherefore, my sentence is, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from being strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren, and wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and the elders and, and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are the Gentiles in Antioch and Cyre Syria and Sicily. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with the words, subverting your souls, your, subverting your souls, saying you must circum, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good. Hold it right there. Hold it right there. Cause this is where we need to slap our Israelite brothers in the mouth at. <laughs> this is where they need to be slapped straight in their mouth. Bow. Read it again. <laughs> <laughs> it says, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you. See, every words. time an Israelite brother coming to us, I then he start reading the scripture, the things that pertain to him from the standpoint of bloodline. The first thing he do is he go out and start troubling everybody else. Go ahead. <laughs> Subverting your souls, saying you must circum you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such command. See, and, and the Israelites is like, we didn't give the Gentiles no such commandments like that because the law belonged to our purpose was. But when we went out, we didn't go out doing that to people. Go ahead. Right. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of 
to our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Read that part again. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Now, he's sending these brothers out, and he's saying that it seems good for us by the Holy Ghost that we don't lay no burdens on you other than the necessary things because they're about to enter into a place where they're dealing with people that do not know anything about the commonwealth of Israel, anything about the laws, the statutes, and the judgment. So he said, we don't want you to go over there burdening people with things that they don't know. Why you tell them, but Jesus ain't the name, it's Jehovah it's Yeshua. Well, at least one thing that the Gentiles got in common, they can agree to call it one name. They all can identify with Jesus the Christ, but how can you tell a Hebrew Israelite with his stiff neck buck, oh, it's Yahweh no, it's Yeshua, no, it's Yahshua, no, it's Yeshua, no, it's Yahshua, no, it's Yahuwah, no, it's Yahweh, no, it's Yahqua, it's, see, this is what I'm talking about. And the, the, these Israelite brothers were not operating like that. They were concerned about the welfare of their brothers who didn't know. And they weren't going to lay no burdens on them. Only thing that they wanted to give them were the things that were extremely necessary and conducive to their growth. All right. Come on, King Rashad. Yes, sir. Picking up a... 15 and 29, that you abstain from meat offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, far ye will. Mm -hmm. So when you start talking about the things now, this is what he was telling them. Okay, don't be burdening no people with all of this stuff. Now, he said things that were necessary things. Tell me how necessary it is that people could be out here talking about, well, you know what? You ain't supposed to be prophesying or praying with your hat, with your hat on your head. Never mind the fact I ain't prophesied nor prayed, but you just see the hat. But the disciples are saying, listen, keep it focused on necessary things. But these are some of the things, oh, it's a shame to a man to have long hair. That ain't nothing necessary. That's something that causes confusion. See, see, what we try to get you to understand, it was a shift that took place in the original Christianity that came by way of the teaching of the Israelites versus the thing that it turned into once Paul got a hold to it. God is the head of man. Christ is the head of man. And God is the, that, that's self-explanatory stuff. But those are not the necessary thing that causes a man's mind and his heart to be pure. The disciples told you what to stay focused on. Just like what he's telling us to stay focused on. Keep away from things offered to idols. That, you know what that means? If we was going to tell you in this day of time, Keep away from things offered to idols. Then that means you have to quit eating meat altogether. Because everything that you eat that come out of the grocery store have been offered to the idol gods of this world. The idol god of money of this world. It ain't been sacrificed to nothing uh, uh, to the most high for no good thing. But this is the condition. Or keep away from things that have been strangled. Okay, when well the Bible tells you don't kill anything that has life. And don't uh, allow yourself to be a partaker of anything that died a horrible death. But you don't know what's going on in these slaughterhouses. Now, I'm not harping on nobody for meat or nothing like that. I'm just using these things as an example. That these are the things that he was trying. Don't be out here drinking no blood. Well, how can you eat the meat without drinking blood? See, you can't separate the blood from the animal. So these are some of the areas that he was challenging some of the people because these were the important things. These were the important things that the Gentiles need to be taught to keep away from fornication. To don't be out here just because they had made all of these things a part of Gentilic culture. 
And whosoever don't forsake houses and land, uh, mother and father, he not worthy to be following me. And this is it. This is the same issue when the Gentiles came. They had to forsake everything in their culture. It's not meat to get the children's bread unto the dogs. Truth, Lord, I know that I'm a dog. I know that I'm up under these customary things, but I'm willing to eat all of it and become the dog that'll sit down and eat the crumbs that fall from your table. If it means that I got to eat rabbit food, so be it. I know I'm a dog. I know that I'm wrong, but I want this breakthrough so bad that I'm willing to sit at your feet and leave my culture and change everything that needs to be changed. This was the mindset of the, of the Christians that sat at the feet of the disciples before the Pauline stuff came into play. Keep going, King Rashad. What else you got? Man, man. Uh, well, we right, do with that. To... Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do with that. We do with that right there. Because <laughs> they don't want to hear that. Paul will teach you you can eat anything. Hey, all things that most high created will be received without thanksgiving. Oh, really? Most, most high created a pig, right? Most high created a human being, right? Most high created a tree, right? Oh, it's okay. You go out there and eat the bark off a tree. Most high created all the metals and all the diamonds. Oh, you can go out there and eat rocks then. All of these things that the most high created. But they're not good for you to eat. So we are looking at the corruption that took place. Once the things that the Israelites were teaching were superseded. Now you don't have the Israelites teaching in this world. Now you have the Israelites that are springing up to start teaching the truth about Scripture as it is written in Scripture. And look what you got. Look at what you got. Let's keep reading and see what else Paul got to do. Man. No, I'm going to go back to this other document. On okay, okay. Right. Let's go. It says, because of Paul's compromise with Rome... With Rome's beliefs and legend, Pauline Christ Christians grew in number and grew in strength. A stage was later reached when kings were used as pawns to further the ends of the church. Oh, read that again. Mm. Why does compromise? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> listening to myself, brother. Is that because of Paul's compromise with Rome's beliefs and legend, Pauline Christianity grew in number. Stop right and there. No wonder why some of us only get 100 views on our videos while some other brothers get 35,000. No wonder why some of us are found walking alone by ourselves, barely having brothers to come along aside of us, and then other brothers got mass numbers of people heaped up to them. Because there's something about compromising that'll just make people want to walk with you, want to hook up with you. Now you start talking about when the disciples was moving in the earth, it wasn't going like that. It said, but through Paul's compromise, what happened? What happened? Pauline Christians, it said Pauline Christians grew in numbers. It said what, what Christians? Strength. What Christians? Pauline Christians. So now they are not just Christians. who They are not just the anointed believing in Jesus Christ. Now they are the so-called anointed believing in Paul. Now they mm. have took it on, the, on themselves the label of Pauline Christians because they have completely detached themselves from the Messiah. And listen, Satan is crafty and cunning as a wizard. If you don't believe that our brothers and sisters in this moment in time are Pauline Christians, they're not Christians after the things. Because if they were Christians after the things of Jesus Christ, they would have so much love for the one that have came and been reconnected with his identity and calls himself an Israelite. They would have so much love for him because they would understand that from his womb was our birth into existence. And if it wasn't for him and what the Messiah gave him, there would be no me. You see, the modern, the, 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 the early day Christians have so much of a love and appreciation 
for the Israelites, that they called themselves by a name that was patterned after the Israelites, the Hebrew anointed. They called themselves the Christ or the Christos or the Christos, the Christian, the anointed ones. They patterned themselves after those that follow the anointed one, the Messiah. You see, for the modern day Christians, they pattern themselves after Paul. Come on, keep going. Let's read. Okay. Pauline Christians grew in number and grew in strength. A stage was later reached when kings were used as pawns to further the ends of the church. Man, that's a lot. Now, now you're talking about they to establish their own church. Because mm -hmm. we know, according to the Bible, it said that the church was geographically located in Jerusalem. That meant that anything that was to move, that had anything to do with the Messiah, it had to go mm. through those who the Messiah left the church in their hands. That's why when Paul got ready to start his ministry, he had to go to the church to get his marching orders. But when they sent him with his marching orders, telling him to focus on those things that were necessary, he completely turned around and did whatever he wanted to do and went so as, as, as far as to establish their own church. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to know, so the book that we're reading out of, Brother Yosef, is, uh, uh, what, what book are we reading out of? Is this the, the Barnabas? This is... Yeah, this is the Gospel of Barnabas introduction. Okay, this is the Gospel of Barnabas. And this is just the introduction. We ain't even got into the, the real Zoe of it yet. And we'll save that for another video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, Sweetie me, Pie, Sweetie Pie is here now. No, I'm just kind of see if you still doing your video. Yeah. Go ahead. I was uh, watching it. You want to well, say me, hi to everybody, Sweetie? Shalom, everyone. How y'all doing? Shalom, Mama. Shalom. Shalom. Hey, don't y'all forget, this video was for our Christian brothers, so I told y'all that Hebrew stuff. Say good afternoon, good evening or something. Shalom, good afternoon, <laughs> good evening. How y'all doing? Peace to all. Goodwill. Yah, God, Father, whatever you want to call him, may he bless you all. Hallelujah. Don't be messing with me. <laughs> uh... Well, let me get to you, give, give you this last uh, paragraph in the, in the next on this page. Do some exercise, yeah. I'm gonna get you a little exercise. Boy, right. I get enough exercise. Well, you, look, you look good, baby. You look green, girl. Come on, girl. Shoot, you want to pretend to be my mistress today? I told you, I'm your, Here we go. Listen, I'm your wife, your mistress, your side chick, your head of this. Tell me what color hair you want her to have. I'm going to try it She's like, you can miss me with all that extra I'm stuff. Gonna I'm like going to be everything girl, extra you need. Them girls on the reality show, blind on one side, blue on the other. So. Pick your choice which color you want, baby. I got you. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's, oh, I'll, praise, I'll praise, I'll praise, I'll praise, I'll honor, I'll glory to the most high. And, and, and Yosef, Yosef, listen, you get these resources. One of the things we, we want our Hebrew brothers to understand is that our brothers that call themselves Christians, originally, the disciples loved them enough to put their lives on the line for them. And when That's those people understood what had been given to them, they loved those disciples back to the point to where they all walked into the lion's den together. They faced the guillotines together. They would be set on fire to light gardens together. But see, this is not the mindset of our brothers today in Israelite heritage, nor our brothers in Christianity. They have made been made to make war with each other. So when we go back and we start getting these resources, we must realize that these resources are not for debate, they are not to make war, but they are for edification of the brethren, of the brethren to a greater understanding. So we ain't striving to tear down nothing but falsehoods, but we want to be able to do it in a way that exemplifies our love for the brethren, period. Okay, King Rashad, let's keep going. Yes, sir. It says the followers of Barnabas 
never developed a central organization. Yet, due to the devotion of their leaders, their number increased very fast. Mm -hmm. These Christians incurred the wrath of the church, and systematic effort was made to destroy them and to obliterate all traces of their existence, including books and churches. I want to read that again. Read that. Read, <laughs> read that again. You said what, man? I want you to read that again. Are right, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. The followers of Barnabas never developed a central organization. Yet, due to the devotion of their leaders, their number increased very fast. Stop right These there. Christians That's something good in there. That's stop right there. That's something good in there. Because, okay, through corruption and compromise, an organization can grow. That's how you got mega churches. And that's how you got big organizations, whether they Israelite or whether they Christian. But the thing is, is that uh, when you don't have the mindset of organized religion or things like that, then the Most High will increase numbers at such a rapid pace. See, the, the thing is, is that you may not even see the numbers being increased. You may not even realize how many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of brothers that are hearing the message that are not attached to any type of association who are doing the same thing and re reciprocating the same type of thing. And so when we start trying to get brothers and sisters to detach themselves from the organizations, you got to be able to draw a line of distinction between the organization and between God. When we tell you to detach yourself from an organization, it's so that you can begin to cling to the righteousness of the Most High or Yeshua HaMashiach. So I'm glad you brought that up there because sometimes when brothers and sisters be careful, sweetie. Sometimes when brothers and sisters have to walk alone, they tend to think it's something wrong with that. You still there, King Rashad? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a good point that was brought out. Sweetie Pie, you heard him get back across the street. Hey, 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 don't talk to me like that. <laughs> okay, baby. Now, don't try. I don't want you to hurt yourself over here, sweetie. Oh, okay, say that, but don't make me go there. 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 Okay, sweetie Pie. But I'm father, sorry. in the name of your son, let him keep doing what he's doing. I'll be, we we still going? Song. We still going over there? I'll be yeah, going there. Know. We go over there as soon as I get to. Whatever you want, somebody. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Go ahead, King Rashad. These Christians okay. incurred the wrath of the church, and systematic effort was made to destroy them and to obliterate all traces of their existence, Wait including a minute, books man. I keep and missing, churches. I keep missing something. I'm distracted. So go back and read it again. <laughs> all right. It says, The followers of Barnabas never developed a central organization, yet due to the devotion of their leaders, their number increased very fast. These Christians incurred the wrath of the church and systematic effort was made to destroy them and to obliterate all traces of their existence, including books and churches. Mm, mm, mm. The less, mm, mm, mm. Y'all hear that? You looking at the true Christian that was taught at the hand of the Israelite. Every effort was made to destroy them. Because you know why? These Greek speaking people. That called themselves the anointed ones. In their environment. Were moving with such impact. And creating such ruckus. While they. Uh, displayed the righteousness. Of the Jesus Christ. That they had never seen before. That the surrounding bodies of people. Even those. <laughs> Paulinian Christians, who else you think was trying to kill him? Mm. Who else you think was trying to kill him? Was that not what Saul of Tarsus was trying to do to the original people? Who do you think was trying to kill him if it wasn't those Pauline Christians 
They went out of their way mm. to kill and to destroy those people because they knew that, listen, you couldn't, you couldn't suppress the thing that was true. And the truth will override anything that is false and they but one thing to do to that thing that's authentic and genuine, and that is to kill it and destroy it. Read it one more time just for the hearing our brothers and sisters so that they can understand that when it said them Christians, they're talking about those Greek-speaking people that believed in the teachings of of Barnabas, who was the Israelite. Mm. All right. These Christians incurred the wrath of the church and systematic and systematic effort was made to destroy them and to obliterate all traces of their existence. Now, including Kick Rashard, books. Kick Rashard. Yes, we, we don't want people to be confused when it said these Christians incurred the wrath of the church what church are they talking about? The Roman. Huh? The okay. Roman, All right. The Roman church. All right. Mm. If they, hold on. Let me go back there. These Christians incurred the wrath of the church and systematic effort was made to destroy them and to obliterate all traces of their existence, including books and churches. The lesson of history, however is that it is very difficult to destroy faith by force. Mm. Mm. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's why, that is why, let me read this scripture for you. Let me read this scripture. I want you to read that last verse again and watch this prophetic precept that I put on top of here. Because the things that were promised to the Israelite would be given to them by the Messiah. And the things that was given to the Messiah would be uh, given to him based on the promise that was made to Abraham. That Abraham was the father of faith and in thee shall all the families of the earth come to receive a blessing. And in this particular case, these Christians had faith. So read that one part again and I'm going to put a prophetic precept on top of that for our brothers can under, brothers and sisters can understand though you may claim a corrupted twisted demented version of Christianity now it is going to be stamped out because it will not be able to override the faith of a people go ahead these Christians incurred the wrath of the church and systematic efforts was made to destroy them and to obliterate all traces of their existence including books and churches the lesson of history, however, is that it is very difficult to destroy faith by force. Now, this is why Jeremiah the prophet quoted this prophecy based on the things that he would see happening in the future to Israel as the Roman Paulinian Roman Catholicism church began to come against the true church, which was born out of faith in Jesus the Christ, or Yeshua HaMashiach. So, listen at the prophetic word that is pronounced by the prophet. This is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 35 through 37. Thus said the Lord, who giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, who divided the sea when the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances shall depart from me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me. Now, through the Roman Catholicism, you have a wicked root that is called replacement theology, which is also known as supersessionism. It is the wrath of the Roman Catholic Church against the true believers in the in, in, that have the faith of the Messiah. It is the wrath of the Roman Church that have come to supersede those that have faith in the Most High. But we see right here, no matter what they do, No matter what they do, it will not work because it cannot destroy the faith of a people. 
And unless the moon and the stars fall out of their ordinances and the sun fall out of the sky and burn everybody up, no matter what Roman Catholicism do through this wicked system in this world that we're living in, it will never be able to stamp out the fate of the seed of Israel because the promise was that by the seed of Israel would all families of the earth be able to come in by way of faith. That's bad, ain't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, what else we got? Yeah. I, I think that's about closing it out for uh, for that for the uh, apostolic, I mean, apostolical age. Yeah. So. So you know. Yeah. So this is the first video. The first video that we are doing, uh, and the video was titled "The Birth of the Christian," and what we are aiming to do is not to cast any brother down that is called a Christian, but rather to show a brother the Christian that he ain't never seen before and what the life of the Christian was like before the Paulinian Christian came into existence and what the life of the Christian was like before there ever was Roman Catholicism because through Roman Catholicism, they have superseded and they took what was rightfully belonged to those Greek-speaking people that were taught by the disciples. When Paul came along and connected himself with the Roman authorities, they took that thing that had been born at the hand of the disciples in its infant stages and then superseded it and established their own church and went out of their way to destroy anybody that was called a Christian because of what they believed and that they got from the disciples, which came from Jesus Christ. And that's what we're trying to get our brothers and our sisters to understand. You have to take a close look at what you say you believe in. Because you can't say you believe one, one side of our mouth. We say we believe in Jesus. But the other side of our mouth, our allegiance is to Paul. For everything that Jesus said no to, Paul came along and said, yeah, it's okay. But use Jesus' name on top of that. So we got to be able to draw some lines of distinction. And one of the things I can't comprehend, King Rashad, is this. Like I asked you the question earlier, how do all our brothers that have been to theology school and cemetery school and all this, how is it that they missed this information? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> how do they miss this information? <laughs> I don't know how they miss it. I don't know how they miss it. But it's intentional because they yes, have another church that's established. Yes, and so yes, when you start talking about the promise that was made to Eve, and I will put enmity between her seed and thy seed. And, and he shall bruise your, your heel and you shall bruise, crush his head. You're talking about an ongoing war throughout time until everything is wrapped up. So you see. That when you had David, you had Goliath. When you had Samson, you had Delilah. When you had is Isaiah, you had the prophets of Baal. When you you know what I'm saying? All of these different things have been wars going on. When you had Moses, you had Pharaoh. You see? You, all these different things that you got going on, you had Solomon and then you had the demons all through life that you going through. And when you got now, you get all the way to the point to where you get Jesus. Well, guess what? Where's the war being waged? You got Jesus and you got Paul. You got Jesus and his 12 disciples. And then you got Pauline and his epistles. You see? And then the people, the people don't understand is that they got to stand in the middle and they, not, they got to be able to make a choice. You got to choose this day who you're going to serve. That's point blank and period. And I can't understand how these brothers can have access to all this so-called information, but you don't understand these things. These are information too. And they are so quick to tell you what a canonized, what's canonized. What, let's go deal with that, King Rashad. Where does this canonization stuff come from? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You 
you know, it, 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 it's deeper than just cannibalization. It's the whole understanding of what I got to bring to <laughs> Oh, man. Mm-mm-mm. Like I said, I, oh, I, that's a whole other video. Man. Yeah, it is. It is another video. So, so we're going to save that. So we're going to save that. And we want our Christian brothers to be encouraged. And we know that that everything that's taught is not learned when it's taught, but nothing is to be discredited, especially when you see it coming out of the scripture. And when you see things coming from a historical standpoint and things that are written by the scholars and the, and the fathers that preceded us, nothing is to be discounted. And our people in, 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 uh, in Christianity have a habit of saying, and I know why they say it. Oh, well, that don't matter. That don't matter what Jesus did. Well, see, that's who we're talking about. We're not talking about anybody else. We don't know nobody else to talk about, you see. But everything matters. He told John, what thou seest, write it in the book. He told him, write it in the book because everything matters. Everything matters. Right. Everything has significance. And so if you hear something that shakes the foundation that you're walking on, then it becomes your responsibility to go and seek out whether or not what's being said is true. It's going to come back one or two ways. Either it's going to be true or it's going to be false. Now, we see our brothers put all kind of videos on social media. And one video we seen yesterday is where they got the popes and the cardinals in there singing songs. But they're singing the song in Latin. And the Latin song that they're singing is being translated into the English language. And they're singing the song to Lucifer. They're singing the song to Lucifer. Now, Everybody that has an understanding knows that many of the scrolls and many of the historical things that have ever been written in form to where we can read them and understand them, understand that Roman Catholicism, through conquest and war, through the Spanish Inquisition, and, and through, what's the other one called, King Richard? Uh, the uh, Crusades. And the Crusades, they conquered. And they took all of those resources. And everybody knows because you've seen it on TV, on the movie, Angels and Demons. You've seen it on the movie, uh, you know, the, the Omega Code. You've seen in the basement of the Vatican, where it's 25 miles underground, 25 miles of bookshelves containing all the different scrolls and everything that had been written. Now, you have to ask yourself this question. If these people know that these things exist and they have cuffed them and chucked them away and hidden them, what does that tell you about these people? It tells you that they cannot be the people of the Most High. They are Satan's people. And the Bible makes it clear that through this mother whore, daughters were born. And those are all of the different tentacles and different sprinkles of what the world have come to know as Christianity through the modern day churches. So when we look at the scripture where the prophetic word says that, and the Lord shall scatter thee from among all the people of the earth, from one end of the earth into the other, and there you shall serve other gods that are represented by wood and stone. You must understand that through Roman Catholicism, the message that's being taught was Jesus was hung on the cross. And on every church in this hemisphere and throughout the world, on every church, you see the symbol of a cross. It does not represent anything concerning the righteous act and righteous deeds of the Messiah. But what that cross represents is Rome's authority that as they went out and put wrath on people of faith, they conquered the Messiah in life. And to try and kill the faith of a people, we will conquer him in death. So they put the symbol of their authority on every establishment in the world, in every church in your community, in every church anywhere, the symbol of Roman authority is right there. And though we know that many of our brothers don't understand these things because they have never learned, they have never been taught in, in that manner, this is what it is. 
This is what it is. It's what it is. And to say these things is saying nothing against Jesus Christ. What we're doing, we're redirecting your attention back to Jesus Christ. Because through these issues, through these things, Jesus Christ ain't a part of that. Ain't a part of that. So, this first video that we done was titled, The Birth of the Christian. When the Christian was born. We use nothing but the scripture and things that are coming out of the Holy Word. No opinion. Everything is what it is. So, you know, we're just going to pray that some of our brothers might hear the message and might respond to it. And uh, we're going to pray and ask the Lord, that he, ask the Most High, that he'll bless his word to go forth. We know it's not going to return into him void. It's going to do what it said it was going to do. It's going to reach who, it, who they say it's going to reach. Hey, let's do this. Let's read that part. Let's read that part before we close this video out about the preachers. Remember what we read? Oh, okay. Let's, let's read that. Because okay. this is going to draw lines of distinction between the people of faith that are doing the bidding of Jesus Christ versus the people in this modern day age that say they serve in Jesus Christ. We're going to mark that. We're going to mark that by the things that are written in the in the Word. All right? Now, give me a second. I got to pull it up. Okay, let's give King Rashad one second, and after that, we're going to end the video, because we're going to look at something that's very significant, because the Most High going to want us to be able to identify, uh, he gives us the ability to be able to identify who's for him and who's not, because there are many people that's going to say that they're for him, and you're not going to be able to tell the difference. You can't tell the difference between the sheep and the wolf because the wolf have draped himself in sheep clothing. And the only way that you'll be able to identify him uh, is to test the nature of the animal. And to test the nature of the animal, a sheep won't never bite. But a wolf, if you poke him, I don't care what kind of clothing he got on, he going to come out. <laughs> yeah, Yo, he going to do that. So that's what we're going to do. And this is what God give us to be able to test the nature of those men in the earth that declare that they are serving him. Yes, sir. I got it. I got okay. It. Uh, so let's go. Uh, this is coming out of the Didiacum uh, teachings of the 12th, chapter 11. It reads, whoever then cometh to... Hold on. Let me start over. Whoever then cometh and teaches you all these things spoken above, receive him. But if the, the teacher himself being misled teaches you another teaching, so as to overthrow this, do not hear him. But if the, if he teach so to advance, hold on, let me just start over. Let me start over here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take your time. Take right. your time, King. Because what we're we about to do, we're about to look at something because we're going to challenge every brother and sister <laughs> that are here in this video, that know that this video is being made wow. based on the things that are written in the scripture. So you're about to be challenged with some things that are coming from the mouth of the ones that the Messiah put his purpose in their hand. This is your okay. challenge. Whoever then cometh and teacheth you all these things spoken above, receive him. But if the, if the teacher himself be misled, teaches another teaching, so as to overthrow this, do not hear him. Now, so here's the he idea. When you know that teachers are coming directly from the scripture, and, te and the teachings is being substantiated by historical facts, and, and by books and things that predate modern day Christianity, he said, then you hear that. Somebody's going to always come along talking about, oh, nah, I don't mean, I, he said, that person you don't even give an ear to because you know where this teaching is coming from. All right, keep going. He says, but if he teach so to advance righteousness and the knowledge of the Lord, receive him as the Lord. But as regards the apostles and the prophets, according to the decree of the gospel, so do ye. And every apostle who cometh to you, let him be received as the Lord, but he shall not remain more than one day. Mm -hmm. If, however, there be need, then the next day. But if he remain three days, he is a false prophet. But when the apostle departs, let him take nothing except bread enough to last him till he reach his resting place. 
But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. Oh, wait a minute. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I know I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. Go back and read that again. <laughs> she did. It says, but if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. Now, now look at this. Let's look at this. I want to put a precept on that from the mouth of Jesus himself. John, 10th chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, when he seeth the wolf coming, he leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth them. The hireling flee because he is a hireling and catch it not care it not for the sheep. Now when this is talking about how to identify the hireling who cares nothing about the sheep, a hireling is one who asks for money. Okay? That's what a hireling is. A hireling is one that asks for money. So every preacher that's at the ham of any pulpit or any church that is asking for money to receive a paycheck, that is asking for money when he goes to another place to preach, that is asking for money anytime he has to put his hand to something. What does it say again, King Rashad? What did you say? About, about asking for money. He said, yeah, but if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. See, he is a false prophet because the false prophet cares nothing about the sheep. And he that asks for money is a hireling. So the Most High gives us ways to where we can measure what men say they are versus who they truly are. We know them by what they do. Because when you truly been gifted to be able to have the heart to promote the Father's righteousness or teach the Father's people, the first thing it is not about is money. You see, because he understands that as long as he take care of the father's business, then the father will take care of whatever business that he had. For foxes and birds have nests and foxes have holes. But the son of man, he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He didn't care about anything in this world. Never did once he ask people for anything. But the most high provided everything that he needed. He said, he that asks for money is a false prophet. And the Messiah said, I'm the good shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep because I love them and I care for them. He said, but the hireling is one that's asking for money. He don't care anything about the sheep. That's why when you go in a lot of these Christian establishment, brothers and sisters, that you see people are more concerned about the money and the gift that you can bring them than anything. And when you got people that's not producing or bringing them money, they'll preach a sermon on you in a minute of a twist in the scripture. Bring the tithe and you curse with a curse. And bring the, well, you ain't got no faith if you don't bring them. But the preacher want to look good too. The preacher want a new suit. Well, nigga, if the preacher want a new suit, want to look good, go and get a damn job. Get to work and buy your own suit. Don't expect the sheep to buy. Right. Come on, keep going. And every speaks in the spirit, you should not try nor test. For every sin shall be forgiven, but this sin shall not be forgiven. See, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because he who got sin, according to John 3.34, he who got sin speak the words of God because God gives that man the spirit. So in essence, it's not that man speaking. It's the spirit of God that is speaking through that man according to the word of God. So he said, whoever is, comes to challenge the one that's speaking by way of the spirit, he said, that man going to suffer. He said, because he's going to be tried. It's what you call blasphemy in the Holy Ghost. It's when you're in denial or you're rejecting the spirit when it comes just because it's coming through a yielded vessel. All right? Okay. 
Right? It says, but not everyone who speaks in the spirit is a prophet, but only if he have the ways of the Lord. So from this, from their ways shall the false prophet and the prophet be recognized. Mm-hmm. And no prophet who in the spirit orders a love feast eateth himself of it, mm-hmm. unless indeed he is a false prophet, mm-hmm. man. And every prophet who teaches the truth, if he practices not that which he teaches, is a false prophet. Mm-hmm. And every approved genuine prophet who summons assemblies for the purpose of showing the earthly mystery, but does not teach others to do all that he himself do, shall not be judged by you, for his judgment is at the hands of God. Mm-hmm. For so did the ancient prophets also. But whoever in the spirit says, give me money or anything else, ye shall not listen to him. But if for others in me, he bids you give, let no one judge. This blessed my soul. Because we tell people all the time, and I have told people all the time and cried real tears while telling it how I've always had a problem with being able to ask people for money for things that I needed as a person. I never have a problem. We're asking people to give things when it comes down to doing things for other people. That blessed my soul because it helped me to understand why I as an individual always felt like that on the inside. That even in my worst time of crisis, I would be like, man, I just, I can't do it. I can't do it. Father, you're going to have to make a way for me. I know I got no problem going on there and tell brothers and sisters, hey, we got a brother and sister that got a problem. You know, can y'all help us get this for our brother and sister? Help us get that for our brother and sister. But when it comes time for me, I could be having the biggest problem in the world. My icebox could be empty and I got the biggest problem in the world coming to ask somebody to give me some money so I can buy me some groceries. You see, because the Most High want his men to be solely dependent upon him, even in a moment of crisis. So it says, read it again, King Rashad. It says, but whoever in the spirit says, give me money or anything else, you should not listen to him. But if for others in need he bids you give, let no one judge you. Mm-hmm. You see, mm-hmm. that's that's the gospel of Mashiach yes, or Jesus the Christ. That we are to love the brethren, that we are to do unto others as mm-hmm. we will have others to do unto us. Because that's what it's about. It's about us doing to others. And then the others will have an opportunity to do for others. And the others in that case would be for us in a time of need or in a time of crisis. We are not to be pre- preoccupied with doing things for ourselves, for our own self-benefit. When we start talking about truly serving the Most High, everything is going out. Everything is going out. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Let your kingdom come that your will might be done in heaven as it is in earth. Give us this day our daily bread. Please forgive us of our trespasses that we may forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are to look unto the most high to sustain us as an individual. Whatever it is that we need, give it to me, Father. Give it to me, Father. And what happens is that as the Father gives to me, now I give to my brother. Everything that you have given me belongs to thine. Thine, the kingdom is yours. Thine, the power is yours. Everything belongs to you. This is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. To our Christian brothers. When you come across people. 
that the old, hey, we need this money for the building for. Hey, we need this money for the ushers meeting. Hey, we need this money for the choir. Hey, we need this money for this. Hey, we need this money for that. Hey, we need this money for the pastor anniversary. Hey, we need this money for the church anniversary. Hey, we need this money for this. Hey, we need this money for that. But ain't nothing going out. You got to be able to see it. What you got? <laughs> what you got to bring, King Rashad? I know, I know, I know you want to laugh, baby. I know no, you want to laugh. That's my king. He got the ministry of laughter on him, boy. I could be having the worst day in the world, and he'll call me. I called him and I said, "What you doing?" I, I'm sitting here laughing at this word that I'm reading. You know what I mean? Yeah. What you got to say, King Rashad? <laughs> No, I just bear witness. I just bear witness like everybody else bear witness to what you were just saying, man. It's, and they had me laughing in my spirit. It brought some joy to me, brother. That's yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we'll look at the birth of the Christian, and then we're going to try to get our brothers and sisters to come to understand the mindset of the Christian that came through the womb of the Israelite. When we get back to that point, we are going to be a force to be reckoned with in this world. We're going to be a force to be reckoned with in this world. So with that being said, we uh, we know the video was a little lengthy, but all praises to the Most High Heavenly Father. We uh, we gonna let the, we let the videos go as long as they go, and if they short, then they cut it off short because that's what the Spirit gives us. If they long, then that's where we're going. But but uh, this is going to be the end of this first video titled uh, The Birth of the Christian. I hope, I hope somebody been blessed by what's been said. All praises. Hallelujah. All praises.